I, I just want to first start by saying I was so grateful that Deacon and Chris recorded your guys' uh, session last week, because while I was sitting on the beach, I was listening to you all cry and talk about how much you love me, and that was great. <laughs> No, that was really, really beautiful, and I share so much of your sentiments. Um, this, this whole, this group in particular, this is a really meaningful thing for me. This year being my last year at Sacred Heart, this like, talk about going out with a bang. Like, this is just awesome, and I was, uh, like, you guys are an incredible, incredible group, and I just feel so privileged to have just uh, been your spiritual father walking through these past many months in this journey, and uh, it's, it's, Holy Saturday was one of those peak moments of your life, you know, for me especially. I just, it, it was a night, I mean, all three nights of the Triduum were just overwhelming, but it was a night of, of absurd joy. And I, I, I could not have been happier to be your priest that night. And it was such, it was such a privilege, it was such a gift to me. So, all right, if I keep going on that vein, I'm going to start crying soon. So, we're moving on. So, this last session, see what I did there? Y'all became Catholic. Now what, right? Okay. This last session, over the past few years as I've taught this, this final session, I, I, it's been, the approach I've taken to it has been a real, like, intense call to mission, right? Unpacking the mission of the laity, sending you out there, right? This, this ooh call to evangelization, right? Like, and like, while all that's true, and we'll touch on that, like the call to, to, to mission and evangelization, all of that, I, I think in hindsight, reflecting on, I don't know, reflecting on the faces that were in my memory of the people as I was giving those talks, I think I scared people in the final session with a little bit too much intensity of like, now get out! Okay, this was the image I had in my prayer, that this was what I looked like in the final <laughs> session. Like, get out there, I gotta chase the world, right? You're Catholic, now go fight everybody. Okay, a little uh, like King Leonidas or William Wallace kind of image. All right, I, I wanna take a different approach, okay? Maybe it's because I was sitting on the beach praying about this, but I wanna take a different approach. Uh, one that's perhaps uh, gentler, a little simpler perhaps. Um, this is what was in my mind, in my heart, for all of you as I was praying about this last session, that you all are newborn baby Catholics. Can I hear an awe? That's right. You are all newborn baby Catholics. For 16 of you, like you just came forth out of the church's ecclesial womb. And for the rest of you, you just have only now been fully integrated into the church's embrace in your full initiation through your, your profession of faith, through your confirmation, through your reception of your first communion, that this is all so fresh. It's all so fresh. Your babies is what you are. I remember when I was just ordained a priest, how often I was told, you're just a baby priest. I'm like, yeah, but you call me father, right? <laughs> but you are, you're just, you're baby Catholics, you're baby Catholics. And, and as we all know, right, babies take time to grow. And, you ha and babies have needs. Babies have needs. So here's, here's what I was asking myself, right? What, what do babies need to grow? And in many ways, those, those needs, um, are very similar to what baby Catholics need to grow and to develop. So that's what we're doing tonight, I'm talking to the babies in the room and the baby Catholics and the baby needs that you have. So here's where we're going to start. Babies need, new Catholics need, a mother and a father. Through your baptism, one of the things that I shared when we were talking about baptism, baptism gives us... Um, it gives us a new identity. You receive what the church calls the filial identity. You receive the identity of Christ, the beloved. You go from being a, an adorable creature to being a beloved son, a beloved daughter of the most high God. That we have this image in our mind that God, like, God really loves Jesus. And he likes us. <laughs> no. Like for the baptized, when God the Father beholds you, he sees his son, he sees his daughter, he sees Jesus hiding in you. We have to begin, and it takes time to begin living out of the new identity that is yours. That you really are a son of the Father, a daughter of the Father. And all of that, all of that brings with it. Like, you have a new authority as you go about in this world. 
Like I think about this story that, that when I was, so my parents were business owners. My whole life growing up, my parents, they owned a, a surgical instrument company. And uh, you know, w winter breaks, things like that, summer break, it was often the case that I was brought to work and I was, you know, it was, it was child labor is really what it was, okay? <laughs> I had to do all these mailers, all these mailers, so many envelopes, all right. All my friends are out sledding, building snowmen, I'm stuffing envelopes. I, I've worked through it, mostly in therapy, so it's all right. <laughs> anyway, I have a distinct memory, about eight years old, and uh, I was back in the repair department of the company, and there was, all the guys in the repair department were really cool guys, rough and tumble guys, working with cool machines and power tools and things like that, fixing surgical instruments. Well, there was this guy back there, his name was John Reynolds. And John used to pick on me. I was eight years old, he used to pick on me. And uh, he just, he was just, poking at me one day, making me feel, I don't know, he just was being a, he, he was being a jerk, okay, that's really what he was, all right, he was being a jerk. And I looked, I was eight years old, I looked at John, I just said, you're fired, okay? I fired him, eight years old. And all of a sudden I got really scared, and I started crying, and I ran up to my dad's office. Everything was fine, everything was fine. I've thought about that story so much in light of baptism, because of this, that there was a point in time in my life as a little boy where I was so secure in my identity as the son of the owner that I felt that I had in me the power to fire the employees. <laughs> I had such a security in my identity that like, like I would walk through the office like I owned the place. Like I would go into my dad's office, I would put my feet up on my dad's desk, things like that. Like if any other employee did that, like they'd be fired, right? They'd be out of there. But I could do that because I was the son of the owner. You walk about this world with a power that you can't even imagine. This is your father's world and you're his child. You have authority. You have power. So when things are messing with you, when temptations are coming at you, to exercise the authority, in the name of Jesus, I silence the voice of accusation against me. In the name of Jesus, I silence the voice... Of, of the temptation of lust coming against me. In the name of Jesus, I silence the voice of discouragement coming against me. You have power and authority because you're the king's kid. To begin living out of the new identity takes time. Right? God is your father. Jesus is your brother. The Holy Spirit is the love that animates the entire family. And the church is your mother. Let Holy Mother Church guide you. Let the church and her teachings protect you. Like, as a Catholic, you don't have to figure it out on your own. My friends who, who were Protestants who became Catholics, that's one of the things they said There was such a radical difference that so when they came into the church, like, as a Protestant, it felt like you were always having to kind of create the party from scratch. As a Catholic, it's like Mother Church is like, every day is a party. I've got it taken care of. I've got the, the decorations ordered. I've got the food taken care of. Like, let me take care of you. Your mother, the church, wants to take care of you. It's not just you and Jesus. It's not just you and Jesus needing the Bible. Because according to the Bible, Jesus gave us the church. Jesus gave us the church as our mother. We need to grow and be formed in the church as our mother. And secondarily, related to that, think back on the session I taught on Mary, that Mary is your mother. I know this is a struggle for people. Even after you, you've come into the church, it can be, it can be a, still a hurdle to get over. But let it take time. She, she's, she's not going to barge in. She's not like a, an annoying, she's not an annoying mother-in-law, okay? <laughs> she's a good mom. She's a good mom. It's really important to have relate, to begin developing a relationship with these, t these two key saints, with, with Mary and with Joseph. Like the word of God, when God became flesh, he entrusted his humanity to this woman and to this man. Where was Jesus formed? He was formed between the love of Mary and Joseph in the home of Nazareth. Like that's where Christ was formed. Guess what you are? You are now little Christ. Who do you need to be formed? You need Mary and Joseph. I just want to encourage you to begin developing a relationship with them. And what I mean by that is in prayer, just simply invite them in. Talk to them. <laughs> Ask the Holy Spirit to bring into your imagination, like, what's in Mary's eye? Mary, what's in your eyes for me right now? Joseph, what are you doing right now? Where are you? Like, they're real. And they're powerful. 
And they want relationship with you. They want relationship with you. All right. Babies and new Catholics need a mother and a father. Here's the next one. Babies and new Catholics need food. You need to be nourished. You need to be nourished. There's several ways I want to talk about this. First is this. I need you to keep nourishing your minds. Please, please, for the love of God, don't be done learning. <laughs> don't be done learning. Don't be done reading. Don't be done studying. Like what we certainly don't need in the church today is more dumb Catholics who don't know their faith. We've got plenty of them. I love them, but they don't know their faith. Like this might frighten you, but this is true. Because you've gone through this, you know more about the Catholic faith than probably 99% of cradle Catholics. The cradle Catholics who are the sponsors of the room, is this true? Yes or yes? Yes. yes. You've heard like the, the, the gold, you've heard the nectar that it's at the heart of all of this that 99.9% .9 of Catholics haven't heard. But don't be done studying, don't be done learning. Like, as I'm sure you felt, and I'm sure you've discovered this year, our faith, our tradition, it is brilliant beyond imagining. It is brilliant. It is so deep. It is so rich. It's inexhaustible. There's still always so much more to learn and discover. Like, I'm, I'm still kind of fresh in my own, like, discipleship with the Lord. I'm, I'm about 20 years into this. I had my initial reversion to the faith as a 16-year-old, as a, a junior in high school, and I've been devouring books, devouring podcasts, devouring talks, devouring content, pretty much from that day without interruption to the current day. Right? I have read so much, I have listened to so much, and I am still learning and still discovering things, still making connections. You're never going to reach the bottom of it. Keep going. For those of you who are podcast listeners, like I'm not going to be putting up slides with images. So if you want to like if you want to get the exhaustive list of what I'm about to say, you're going to have to re-listen to the podcast. You're going to have to have really fast handwriting. But I want to recommend a bunch of podcasts to you right now. Okay, you don't feel free. You, don't, you can go back and listen to it on the podcast. Here's some great podcasts. If you're a podcast person, here's some great podcasts that I would recommend. I, I would recommend Pints with Aquinas with Matt Frad. I would recommend Word on Fire, that's Bishop Barron's podcast. The Road to Emmaus, that's with uh, Dr. Scott Hahn. I'd recommend this little podcast called Slaking Thirst. hey -o. <laughs> Me and Father, uh, uh, Father Ryan Mann and I, that's the podcast. We put our homilies and talks and things like that. That's, uh, that's it's pretty humbling and cool. Check out slakingthirst.com. Dan built slakingthirst.com. So we got a new home. It's going to be pretty cool. A lot of cool things coming there. Another great podcast is Ask Christopher West to get more of the theology of the body stuff. That's such a great thing he does with his wife, interviews, um, just questions with his wife. The Thomistic Institute podcast for the, the real uh, kind of nerdy theologian philosophers in the crowd. They're just amazing talks that these Dominican priests do. Another great podcast is called The Council of Trent. It's with uh, Will shaking his head. He likes that one. Trent Horn. Trent Horn, yeah, Catholic apologist Trent Horn. He's brilliant. And uh, just th one for the ladies, abiding together with uh, some three, three beautiful women, Sister Miriam James Heidland, Heather Kim, and Michelle Benzinger. They, they're three best friends, one's a nun, two are married women. Um, just a really beautiful podcast. So those are, those are ones I would recommend. Of course, there's still form.org. If you, if you still have yet to check out form.org, like shame on you, get on that. It's the Catholic Netflix. There's so many movies and talks and video series, study series, like thousands upon thousands of hours of content is there. Also, Augustine Institute, thousands upon hours of amazing content is there. If you're a reader, who are my readers in the group? If you're a reader, okay, if you're a reader, I would recommend any book, an author, that's published by these publishing houses. To, to give you an exhaustive list of books and authors, I'd be here all night. But these, these are trusted publishers that you can you pick anyone off the shelf, and it's going to be great content. You're looking at Ignatius Press, looking at the Word on Fire Institute, their, their uh, publishing house, the Theology of the Body Institute. And the last one I would recommend is The Road to Emmaus Press. Any of the books published by um, those publishing houses are so good, such good material. 
So we're talking about being nourished, right? So that's nourishing your intellect, nourishing your mind. But you also need to nourish your heart and your soul. It was funny. I was talking to, um, Jess, what class did I have today? Six. Sixth grade. I was talking to the sixth graders today. We, we got on the subject briefly about music and the way that music affects our hearts. It affects our souls. And this is something that philosophers have known. Like, Plato was writing about this, about, like, you want me to take over a city, let me take over the poets and the musicians, right? Like, music has a deep effect on our hearts and our souls. So be looking at the music that you're listening to. Like, get in the habit of just letting your heart and your mind bathe in beautiful music, whether that's classical music or Gregorian chant or any contemporary praise and worship kind of music, but let your heart and your soul, your mind be bathed in beauty. Let it lift you up. If you're a Spotify person, if you're a Spotify person, I'm a Spotify person. If you're looking for playlists to, to, to find, um, you're welcome to, to follow me and follow any of the playlists. My, my Spotify handle is Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z underscore P-R. Great playlist, meditation, like, the, like the, the playlist that we were doing that night of adoration. That's all on there, right? Okay, most of all though, in terms of nourishing yourselves, you must nourish your divinized body. You don't just have a normal mortal human body. You have a body that's been divinized, and it is being divinized. God has joined his nature to your body. Your divinized nature needs to feast upon divinized nature. You need to feast on the bread of angels. You need to feast on the bread of life. You need to feast on the Eucharist. This is a non-negotiable. This is a non-negotiable absolutely every single week and holy day of obligation. But here's the thing. I don't want to even just settle for that. I want to challenge you. Get yourself to at least a, a second mass during the week. Get yourself, if you can, to a daily mass. Adding a second mass during the week, it will change your life. It will absolutely change your life. You have to nourish your new divinized nature with divinized nature with the bread of angels, right? Babies need milk. Catholics need the Eucharist. We cannot survive without the Eucharist. You will shrivel up and die, spiritually speaking, without the Eucharist. You need the Eucharist. Okay, we're, we're making good time so far. All right, how are we doing? Are our hands getting cramped because I'm talking too fast? Okay, it's fine. Next one. You need, you need to trust the process and to let things happen and to let things unfold over time. Babies and new Catholics need to trust the process and to let things happen and to let things unfold over time. Friends, you, you've, you didn't just sign up for a new club. You've become something. That's why we called this becoming Catholic. It's not earning a new label, it's becoming a new reality. You've become something, and you're still in the process of becoming something. Right? This is the, the Catholic already and not yet vision of things. You've become something, and you're becoming something. You've become holy, and you're being sanctified. You've been saved, and you're being saved. You need to trust the process. You need to know, you need to know that this change in you, while it is real and while it is dramatic, it needs time to unfold and to grow and to develop in you. And, and it will happen imperceptibly. It'll feel like a long time, like you're not really making any progress, probably. It might even feel like you're going backwards. But you have to trust the process and trust that it's going to take time. Right? You don't plant an acorn in the ground and expect an oak tree there the next day. It takes time. Like a baby would seem awfully ridiculous to us if, if like at seven months old, she's mad at herself because she can't do backflips like Simone Biles on the balance beam. Give it enough time, maybe she will. But right now, you're not supposed to be able to do that. And it's OK that you can't. It's really OK if prayer is really hard for a long time. 
It's really okay if going to Mass still is a struggle for a long time. It's really okay if you struggle with a relationship with Mary for a long time. It's really okay. Let it simmer. This is so important. I can't stress this enough. Because the enemy, the enemy is a rusher. Not the Heavenly Father. The enemy is a rusher. God is infinitely patient with you and with me. Thanks be to God and with your progress. And God loves baby steps. He loves babies, and he loves baby steps. They're not very big, they're not very impressive, and they're not very coordinated, but man, does he love them. Think about your life as an adult right now. Does anybody ever get excited about your steps? No. Like, you walk down here, no one's like, look at you. <laughs> But once upon a time in your life, there were people in your life who lost their minds because you took one or two steps. And to God the Father, you are always his baby. And he will celebrate your baby steps. St. Paul says in, in his letter to the Corinthians, the, of all the adjectives that he could have reached for when he was describing love, the very first adjective he chose was patient. Love is patient. Thanks be to God, love is patient. One of the things that I hear so often in the confessional from really good, well-meaning people, I often hear in the confessional, well, I, well, this is how I say I, I, I say that I hear people in the confessional shooting all over themselves. Like, I should be better than this. I should be over this by now. I shouldn't be struggling with this. I shouldn't be thinking like this. I should be praying better. I, 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 I shouldn't be falling into the same temptation, the same trap, the same line of thinking over and over and over again. Right? Shooting all over yourself. And I, I want to sit there, and sometimes I do say this, but it's like, shouldn't you? Like, who told you that you should be more advanced or advancing faster than you are? Like, who do, you, who do you suppose is trying to discourage you by getting, to you, getting you to look at how pathetic your baby steps are? Do you think that that's the voice of your father who is the author of all encouragement? I don't think so. We have just such a proclivity to listen to the voice of discouragement, and we get so frustrated at our baby steps. Don't be frustrated at your baby steps. You need, to, you need time to let things simmer. A lot has happened to you this year. A lot has happened to you in the last few weeks. And you just got to let it simmer. If you haven't done any journaling about these past few weeks, you should do some journaling. If you haven't gone back and just sat with the pictures and just prayed, reflecting on the pictures, you should do that. Right? God cooks with the crock pot, not the microwave. He puts it on low and slow. Right? He, he cooks up a universe over you know, 30 billion years. He's in no rush. He's in no rush. You need, to let, you need time to let the psychology, your way of thinking, catch up to your fancy philosophical word. You need your psychology to catch up to your ontology. Ontology means your, your being, your nature. It takes time for our minds to catch up to what's happened to us. This was true for me in priesthood. I like, I got ordained, May 21st, 2016. My ontology, my nature was changed. But it took my mind a long time to wrap my head around the fact that I'm a father. How often it would happen when I was at my first assignment within those first few months, people were like, hey, excuse me, father. Excuse me, father. Father. I'm like, oh, they're talking to me. <laughs> right? It takes time. It takes time. OK, and last but not least, certainly not least, probably most important, you need time to let your relationship with the Lord develop in prayer, both, both in his presence, in his Eucharistic presence when you can, and also not in his presence. You need to let that happen. You need to develop what I, I want to call a Catholic prayer life, which is not, not just devotional, although there's a beautiful place for devotions. 
Um, we have in our tradition, as, as Catholics, all of us Catholics, beautiful prayers, right? Beautiful litanies, beautiful devotions from the rosary to the chaplet of divine mercy to stations of the cross. We've got, you know, spiritual reading from mystics and saints. You, in, in our modern age of the church, we've got like, we've got all these, I mean, we've got the hallow app, we've got um, laudate, we've got uh, the devotional Bibles and the Blessed Is She series and Exodus 90. We've got all of these devotional things, which are all good in their own way. And, and as new Catholics, one of the things I've heard over the years is this temptation. It can feel like, oh my gosh, like, like I need to do all of this stuff to be a good Catholic. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. First of all, you by your very nature are good. And you by the fact of your baptism, your profession of faith, confirmation, the Eucharist, you are a Catholic. You are always a good Catholic. Now, whether you are a good Catholic who is progressing in holiness and striving for the kingdom, that's a separate issue. But you and your nature, as a Catholic, you are always a good Catholic. So don't ever listen to a voice that's condemning you, telling you, I'm not a good Catholic. That's, that's BS. That's from, that's from hell. I want to give you two recommendations about this in terms of time and prayer and all this stuff. So we've got all these devotions, right? All these beautiful parts of our faith. For now, just pick one of them. Just pick one to incorporate into your prayer routine. Whether you're going to pray a rosary driving into work, whether you're going to pray a chaplet of divine mercy, whether you're, there's just going to be one beautiful prayer that you like from that St. Joseph book that you're going to pray every morning. Just pick one, one of these rote devotional standard prayer things. And then I want you to develop this deeper relational kind of prayer, too. And here's, why, here's how I want to I get at this. So part two is in two parts. Can you track with me? OK. Part two, two parts. First part, part two. This is, I feel like I sound like Thomas Aquinas. OK. That was very <laughs> grandiose. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> oh, man. Check the ego. All right. Just the greatest, smartest saint who's ever lived. I feel like I sound like him. All right. All right. Here's what I want to say. Uh, two very Catholic ways of developing this deeper relational kind of prayer. And by, by Catholic, I mean they come from the liturgy. They come from um, saints and from our tradition, right? They're, they're, they're ways of praying to go deeper, right, in your personal relationship with the Lord. The first is this. We call it Lexio Divina. We've talked about this before. Lexio Divina. It's Latin phrase for divine reading, holy reading. Every day of the week, the church in the entire world is praying the same scriptures for mass. So pray liturgically, right? Let the church's liturgy determine, dictate what scriptures you're going to be praying with. There's a lot of ways you can do this. You can, you can get a subscription to Magnificat. Does anybody here, by the way, right now have a subscription to Magnificat? Linda does. OK. It's a, it's a beautiful monthly publication that gets shipped to you that has all the readings for Mass. It's got prayers. It's got beautiful reflections from saints from the tradition. It's a beautiful, it's just a beautiful publication. So Magnificat.com, that can get shipped to you for an annual subscription fee. You can go to the USCCB website. That's the bishop's website to see the daily readings. You can get one of these apps, the um, iMissile app or Laudate app, any of these apps that, that have the daily readings. So you're just going to be praying with the scriptures. It's God's voice speaking to you. We need to become familiar with our Father speaking to us through the scriptures. And again, this is the, the, the tradition of Lexio Divina as a way of praying with the scriptures to go deeper into them. Um, so here, here's, here's the steps. I've really simplified the steps. We could do a whole night on this. and I'm just going to do like 15 seconds. The first step of Lexio Divina is you take some time to read and pray with the text slowly. You're asking the question, God, what are you saying in this text of scripture? You're just trying to answer that question. God, what do, what do you seem to be saying? You're becoming familiar with the text. And the next question you're asking is, God, what do you seem to be saying to me in my life, my context, in and through this scripture? Like this is where you're letting it get personal. And then the third step is God, here's what I feel moved to say to you. So you respond. And then the fourth step, the fourth step, I just call it love fest. <laughs> it's just where you sit and soak in the love 
of your Father who's with you, who delights in you, who adores you. And the second prayer, so this is part two of part two, okay? The second prayer that I want to, or way of praying that I want to recommend to you, it's called the examine prayer. I do this every day. The examine prayer. It's from St. Ignatius of Loyola, um, who's just an indispensable, um, indispensable player in the tradition of, uh, the spiritual tradition. So many Catholics falsely assume that the goal of the examine prayer is to examine myself at the end of the day to notice my failings before God, to repent, and to be committed to doing better the next day. For any cradle Catholics, does that sound familiar? Yes. Does that sound like a really sustainable way to develop a loving relationship with the Father? To end the day every day by thinking, man, yeah, I suck. <laughs> I guess I'll try harder tomorrow. No. no. That, ain't, that ain't from the Father. Ignatius says this. And he said, if you scrap every prayer, that's fine. You must not scrap the examined prayer. The point of the examined prayer it's to review my day with the help and the light of the Holy Spirit and to notice perhaps what I didn't notice throughout the day. All of the little moments of grace, all of the, what I call like the sparkling moments where God was trying to reach me, where my father was trying to love me, where my father was trying to console me, to bless me, to move me, to break into my world. Like, where, where, where was he winking at me that I missed it? Because I was so distracted and moving about my day. I just, I was too busy to let myself experience his love during the day. And then what you do at the end of the day is you receive all of the love and the grace that the Father was trying to give you throughout the day. So you go to bed bathed in the Father's love for you. Yeah, like, yeah. All right. Moving on to the fourth need. Babies need and new Catholics need others in their lives. Friends, while this becoming Catholic journey is done after tonight, which is very weird for me, this being the last night of the last year of the last group doing this. Your time of growing together is not done. Like, I hope and I pray that, that, that this is not the last time that you meet and happen to sit with these people, that you're, that you're sitting with and talking with your sponsor, that you're sitting with and talking with the people in this room, the team members. Like, that would be awfully sad. <laughs> I hope and I pray that you have get-togethers, that you have dinners together, that you have reunions, that you get drinks together, that you have coffee dates with each other, you know, that, and like sponsors, I want to put a particular burden on you to, to like you're, we're not, like you're not like a, like a mother shark, right? You give birth to your baby and you're like, <laughs> goodbye, right? I hope I, I see you in heaven, <laughs> you know? Good luck. Yeah. Keep the initiative going, right? Keep walking with them. Keep walking with the person who's sitting with you who just became Catholic. For some of you, that's easy because they're your spouse. But for those of you who are not married to your sponsor, <laughs> keep up the conversation, right? Keep checking in. Keep calling. Keep texting. Like, friends, like, we need friends in the spiritual life. We need friends on this journey, right? And I have found in my life that friendships in the Lord, right, friendships rooted in Christ, are by far the richest of friendships, right? Because love is at the center, and Jesus is the most vulnerable one. And the only path to intimacy, the only path to relationship, the only path to connection is through vulnerability. So when you got the king of vulnerability at the heart of your relationship, it really begets vulnerability out of you. And it turns out that you get to have an amazing relationship with people, all because of Christ. Nobody gets to heaven alone. None of us. Like we are walking together along the way. Right? Christ, Christ didn't send them out one by one. Even though, think about this, even though he could have covered twice as much ground, twice as much territory, he strategically limited himself by sending them out two by two. 
in some ways to highlight the fact that it's more important to walk with someone than where you're going together. He sent them out two by two. The first people he encountered on the morning of the resurrection was Cleophas and his wife, a couple walking in the wrong direction. Jesus cares about them two by two. It's so important. It's so important. Because truth be told, like, the road can be really hard sometimes. You know on Boyer right now, there's, they, there's a new sign there that's been there for, like, I don't know, a month or so now. It just says, rough road. <laughs> Every time I see that sign, I'm like, amen. I know. <laughs> some days. Some days are a rough road. <laughs> some days are. It's, it's some, some months are hard months. Some years are hard years. Some decades are hard decades. We have hard seasons, and we can, we can lose sight of the goal. We can forget who we are. We can forget who we're called to be. We can forget where we're meant to be going. Forgetting is easy. I mean, it's part of why I think the Lord so often talks about memory in the scriptures. The importance of memory, calling to mind. Like, you forgot who you are. You forgot who I am. You have to remember. I have a friend who's he's a missionary down at Damascus. And he shared with me, this was a few years ago, and I've never forgot it. He shared with me this image that he received in prayer one time. It, it was regarding the relationship of Peter and Paul, right? The twin pillars of the apostolic church. That Paul's out there uh, and doing his missionary activity. He's, he's establishing churches, establishing communities, and he is just getting the crap kicked out of him. <laughs> like, literally. He's, he's been run out of towns. He's getting beaten up, flogged, stoned, imprisoned, shipwrecked, robbed, like arrested over and over and over again. Like several times, Paul just offhandedly says, and they thought I was dead, but I wasn't. You know, you're like, jeez. That's a preacher. So I, I have this image of Paul being filled with such discouragement. And my buddy has this image that Paul's being filled with such discouragement and he's just lumbering his way, getting back to Rome where Peter is in the early church. And Paul is looking really haggard and exhausted and he comes to Peter and he just says, brother, like, remind me. Like, remind me again. Remind me Tell me, tell me again, remind me what Easter morning was like. Remind me what was in his eyes. Just, just tell me again, tell me the story again. What was it like, that conversation on the seashore of Galilee? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What was it like to be glued back together with mercy? Just, just remind me again. And I, I just see... Peter telling him the stories again and Paul being filled up, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Like at times in scripture, at times in our lives, like we will be called upon to be a Barnabas. We hear about Barnabas in the, in the re readings this week for daily mass. He was a figure from the New Testament, uh, for, from the Acts of the Apostles. His name was Joseph. But the, the, the apostles gave him a nickname. The nickname was Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, which makes you wonder, like, what was this guy like? What kind of character did this man have for the apostles to, just to give him the nickname son of encouragement, one who gives heart? Like, there'll be times when you're asked to be the Barnabas, and there'll be times when you're you're going to be looking for and needing a Barnabas. We need community. We need each other. We, de we desperately need each other. All right, need number five. Babies need, and new Catholics need lots and lots and lots and lots of love. Lots of love. St. John Paul the Great, he said that man cannot live without love. He remains a being who is incomprehensible to himself. Like we were designed to run on love, to receive it and to give it. 
Like we receive love in the mass. We literally hear love himself speaking in the mass. Do you know what the scriptures are? They're, 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 they're the love letters from heaven. That's what they are. Those of you who ever did like long distance stuff, do you not save the letters? Do you not go back and read them? Like I, I would hope and pray that by the end of our lives, our Bibles would look like the folded up, obsessed, crinkled pages, dog-eared pages, coffee-stained pages of, of an obsessed lover who is so intent on reading the words of the beloved over and over and over again. Like, I just want to keep hearing him say who I am. I just want to keep hearing him tell me the stories. And you can't give what you, you don't have first. Like, you can't give what you haven't received. We literally hear love speaking at Mass. We literally feast. We eat love incarnate at Mass. We receive love in prayer. Like, as our hearts are still and our hearts are quiet, like, the good shepherd comes real close and he begins to whisper, like, his song over you. He begins to whisper his words of love, particularly for you. I've often thought of, right, the enemy, right, the enemy's a rusher. He's also a shouter. He's loud. But God, because he's a lover, he's a whisperer. The sentiments of love are, are, are always best expressed in whispers with a very soft voice. That's so why when I think back on the, the rubrics of the mass, the old mass, let's just say, there were parts of the mass that the priest had to say sotto voce, which is Latin for very low voice. In other words, a whisper, that we were whispering words of love to our God. You got to get in the practice of being still and quiet. And that's hard. And let it take time, because we are all deeply, deeply like allergic to silence and addicted to noise. But we got to get in the practice of quiet and silence because our God whispers to us. The good shepherd whispers his song of love. Like when Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, my, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. He was speaking something that his, his listeners would have understood, that in the ancient world that when sheep were born, the shepherd has his own song that he would sing over the newborn sheep at the beginning of their lives. And they would become familiar with their shepherd's song and his shepherd's voice. And when all the shepherds would come together, their flocks would intermingle. The way that they would separate them was each shepherd would move off in a distance and would just begin singing his song. And his sheep would go there, and his sheep would go there, and his sheep would go there. Friends, what, what, is, what is the song that the shepherd's been singing over you your whole life and you just maybe haven't heard it yet? You need to hear his song. And what we've received, we have to give. A year ago, when, when Jess and I and Deacon and a few others from the parish, when we were on that pilgrimage to the Holy Land, we went to the Dead Sea. Do you know, what, you know why the Dead Sea is the Dead Sea? Anybody know? Nothing can live in it, but why? Why is it dead? Will? Because of all the salt. There's a lot of salt in there. Linda? There's no outlet. There's no outlet. There's no place for the water to go. So it's just stagnant. And it collects all of those minerals, and it just builds up, and the saline level is just off the charts. That's why you can like float on the water. That's why everything dies in it. Um, but the reason why it's dead is because there's no outlet. There's no place for the water to flow. Like, you will die spiritually if you do not receive love. And you will die spiritually if you're not giving it away. 
if you're not looking for opportunities to pour love out, if you're looking for a place to start, just flip to Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations. When Jesus says, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. A stranger, you welcomed me. Sick and in prison, you visited me. I, there's a lot of concrete ways that we can do that without having to hop on a plane and fly to Bangladesh. There's a lot of ways you can do it right within your home. Like there are people in your life who are starving for love. Who because of their own sins and their own past, they're just naked and exposed and nobody is giving them the time to clothe them in dignity. There are people that you know who are imprisoned in their own addictions and their own brokenness. Imprisoned in shame. You might not be able to solve and you probably won't be able to solve any problem. Notice that Jesus simply said, you just have to visit me when I'm in prison. He didn't say you have to break me out of prison. That's pretty good news. You have to, you have to receive love and you have to give it away. All right, number six. We're nearing the end. Babies need and new Catholics need all the boo-boos to be kissed. You need healing. You need a lot of healing. Jesus, his identity, he says he's the Savior. I did not come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I came for the sick. He came for the sick. I'm going to say it one more time. He came for the sick. You are not expected to be perfect. He expects you to be sick. He expects you to have needs. He expects you to have brokenness and wounds. And while the world has taught us that all of those things are liabilities to relationship and liabilities to love and things that we have to be ashamed of and hide and bury and mask and keep far away from the gaze of anybody else because if anybody else knew what was going on in me, then my God, no one would want to be sitting next to me. Jesus says, I came for your sickness. The word Savior comes from the word soter, which has the connotation of um, healing, wholeness, like putting things back together. That's who he is. He's the one who puts things back together. Remember that nursery rhyme, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again? It's because they didn't know the right king. <laughs> they didn't know the right king. He wants to restore the glory of your humanity. He wants to heal you. He wants to redeem every part of your life. Every chapter, every paragraph, every story, every hurt, all the brokenness, he wants to and, and will, between now and eternity, everything will be brought into the light. You, you never have to spiritually live with a limp. Like, this is what I find so fascinating about Jesus, that he goes into Simon's, the home of Simon's mother-in-law, and she's lying sick with a fever, right? And he doesn't look at her fever and just say, ah, she'll be fine. It's just a fever. He rebukes the fever. He raises her up. And then like a few chapters later, there's a dead girl, and Jesus raises her up. So that's the window. That's the spectrum from fevers to corpses. There's nothing 
there's nothing excluded from his healing gaze. He wants to heal it all. He wants to heal it all. He wants to heal, and he actually can transform deep old habits. He can heal painful memories, not so that they just go away, but he can make his presence so present in all of the painful places in your story that when you think back on those places, you can only now remember them as places where, where you were incredibly loved by Jesus. We have a God who's outside of space and time. Do you think he's looking at your story going, I don't know what I'm going to do about that thing that happened during fifth grade. <coughs> he's a God who's outside of space and time. He can step into every section of every chapter. He's like the author outside of the book. He can flip there. He can go there with you in your memory. He can show you another way for your mom to respond to you when you came home. He can just show you another way. Mary can be there. Joseph can be there. Like when the worst thing happened to you, on the worst day of your life, he can show you how powerful his love is. And it can be changed. And you'll look back on that and think, I am so loved there. There is real grace, friends, in the sacraments. I have a friend who, who when he became Catholic, he tells the story that, like, that after a few months of going to confession, it was his kids who noticed the change in him first. That, like, man, Dad, Dad just seems different. Like, he doesn't seem as withdrawn. He doesn't seem as anxious. He doesn't seem as snippy with us. Like, Dad just seems different. And that just came out one night at the dinner table. And, and, and he said, the only thing that I could attribute it to was, the, was real sacramental grace. Like, it's real. A confession, just like Eucharist, must be a part of your life. Confession must, must, must be a regular part of your life. I'm just going to tell you this. Like, just plan on going at least once a month. That might sound like a lot, but it's probably not a lot. <laughs> Put it in your calendar. Put it, make it as an appointment in your calendar. Like, make it concrete that you're going to go to confession once a month. If you've got a family with little kids still, go as a family. Make your kids stand there in line with you. Dad goes in first, then mom goes in, then kids go in. Because kids need to see that their dad, who's their first, the first face of the father to them, also bows before the authority of God the Father and needs healing and needs mercy and needs forgiveness. Go at least once a month. It's not because Father Joe and I are just like, what are we going to do on Saturday mornings? <laughs> Let's make people guilty to get here and talk to us. No, you need to go. Your spouse needs you to go. Your kids need you to go. The confession's not magic, right? The sacraments are not magic. They really do like what they do. They do the work of forgiveness of sins, but our disposition really does matter. It does make a difference. And healing, right? It's a sacrament of healing. It's not, it's not simply a sacrament of guilt alleviation, right? So many people go into the sacrament of confession thinking like I'm stepping into a spiritual laundromat. Like I've got these stains on my nice white blouse sole and Father, can you just put the you know, spiritual tied to go pen on my soul to make it go away? Like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> but it's, it's meant to be deeper than that. It's, it's meant to be deeper than that. Healing is a process. And yes, yeah, sometimes God does just come in in a fell swoop, just take out a spiritual tumor that's been plaguing you for a long time. I've seen it happen. I know people who just, like that, never dealt with that issue ever again. But that's not normal. Like St. Paul talks about, like, the Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh. He says, an angel of Satan to beat me down, to keep me from being too elated. And three times I asked the Lord, take this away from me. And three times the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. The power is made perfect in weakness. Like, God didn't have this, like, 
Stockholm Syndrome complex where he, like he needed St. Paul to need him, so he just kept him sick. No, oftentimes God allows us to persist in habitual sin for a long time because there's a deeper tumor, there's a deeper issue at play here than just this surface sin. The deeper issue is our belief that I'll be more lovable if I wasn't dealing with this. And so God says, I'm going to let this stay. And you'll keep falling. And I'll keep kissing your boo-boos. And I get to keep showing you again and again and again and again and again and again that my nature is love and mercy. And you already have all of it. You won't be more lovable when you're not dealing with this. That's a hard one for a lot of us to learn. Oftentimes, confession, it's like chemo and radiation therapy, where like we go in and we expose the tumor again to him, and he applies his mercy, and maybe it just shrinks by a few millimeters. And the next time, it shrinks by a few millimeters, and again and again and again and again. All right, those were the six needs that I had for us, the six needs of babies, the six needs of new Catholics. But I have two final appendices. I've been rereading Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien is all about his appendices. So I've got two appendices for you that don't really apply to babies at all. So we're done talking about babies. But they do apply to new Catholics. First is this. OK, back to Lord of the Rings. All right. This is a shot from the end of the Return of the King where the men of the West are surrounded by the evil forces of Mordor. Odds don't look too good, right? OK, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The battle is real. This is the first appendix, appendix one. The battle is real, and the enemy is coming for you. The battle is real, and the enemy is coming for you. But wait, there's more bad news. OK. Things will get harder now that you're a Catholic. Not necessarily easier. Some things will get easier, but also some things will get harder. Because you have a target painted on you now. You became an enlisted member in the Ecclesia Militans, the fighting church, things will get harder. Expect opposition. Like, expect betrayal. Expect everything that happened to Jesus to happen to you. When you step forward and you receive the Eucharist, you're receiving the Paschal mystery, you're receiving the whole Christ. The whole Christ, with all of his mysteries, not just the joyful mysteries, not just the glorious mysteries, not just the luminous mysteries, but also Jesus with his sorrowful mysteries. Jesus who was betrayed by close friends. Jesus who was handed over, who was misunderstood. Jesus who was maligned. Jesus who was just beaten up. Jesus whose love was rebuffed and rejected and spurned and scorned Jesus, who was just thought the worst motives of. This will be your lot. When you step forward and you receive the Eucharist, you're receiving the whole Paschal mystery, the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is something that I have wrestled with in my own priesthood, in my own life. That for a long time, I felt like I just wanted to be conformed, unknowingly, I think, but I wanted to be conformed to like Palm Sunday Jesus, right? Riding into Jerusalem, heralding the crowds, Hosanna to the son of David. What my spiritual director called homecoming King Jesus. <laughs> the guy they throw, to, throw a ticker tape parade for. But that same Jesus, a few days later, the crowd is now shouting, crucify him. Expect discouragement. Expect friends who you thought would understand that they won't understand. Most of all, expect the cross. Not as a punishment, 
not because you did anything wrong, but because it's an invitation to intimacy, to be with him, to be with him, to offer your suffering in union with Jesus for the redemption of the world. Like that's why Catholics say things like, offer it up. You know what that means? It means I am not going to let this suffering go to waste. Father, I offer it to you in union with your son for the redemption of the world. The cross is coming in a million ways. Not because you're bad, not because you need to be punished, not because God's disappointed in you, but because you are now Jesus in the world. That's what it means to be baptized. That Jesus is sharing his life with you. You are sharing your life with him. And where Jesus is, the enemy prowls, always. And the Father always invites us to receive the cross. Here's the second appendix. These are the words that the priest or deacon say to the newly baptized. You have been enlightened by Christ. Walk always as a child of the light. Keep the flame of faith alive in your hearts. Second appendix. You have a mandate on your life now. You have a call to share with others the gospel that you have received. This is where I turn into King Leonidas from 300. All right. Saved souls, save souls. Rescued people, rescue people. You've been saved, you've been rescued. Now, Christianity, it is not your private hobby. You do not get the luxury of being a private Christian. This is not a private hobby. If you want a private hobby, take up Sudoku or Wordle, which I've never, ever, ever gotten on the first try. Remember at the Easter Vigil, when you were handed a candle, those of you who were baptized, you were handed a candle, and what did I have you do immediately after your candles were lit? What did you go do? You went out into the congregation, you found someone else's candle, and you lit it. It's a very cheesy analogy, and there's some very cheesy early Christian songs from the 90s that make me think of this. But this is the very simple form of your mandate. Go find someone else who has an unlit candle and go light them. Your spiritual arsonists, spiritual incendiaries, go find someone whose candle is unlit and spend the rest of your life trying to find and light them. How are you going to do this? Well, first and foremost, go and tell your pagan friends that they're all going to hell. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. That was the Pino talking. All right. No. First, you're going to do this. You're going to ask God to create moments and opportunities for you to do this. You're going to ask him, create moments, create opportunities for me to share my faith, for me to find someone's candle who's unlit and to light it. Two, you're going to be on the lookout for these moments. You're going to keep your eyes open. And when they show up, number three, you're going to have the courage to do it, to say something to engage the person. And if you can, you're, you're, you're going to share your testimony, which is not a long speech. All you're, all you're asked to do is to share the story of how Jesus and the Catholic Church has changed your life. You are already an expert in that. You don't need to go be like a theologian or go get a doctoral degree. You are an expert in you. In fact, you're the world's expert. You're the number one authority on how Jesus has changed your life. And I know we can ask the question, like, will that even make a difference to share my story? Well, what does Scripture say about this? This comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4. And with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And with great grace, and great grace was upon them all. Like, that's all they had. <laughs> They didn't have bishops. They didn't have seminaries. They didn't have anybody in important positions. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any influential contacts. They didn't have any churches or church buildings. They didn't have any, like they had 11, you know, Judas killed himself. But they had 11 bishops. 
Same number of priests. They hadn't had deacons yet at this point when Jesus ascended back to the Father. What did they have? They had a, a, a surrounding culture that was utterly antithetical to them. They just crucified Jesus. What they had was their story. What they had was their testimony. What they had was their conviction that life with Christ is better and that the world needs to know him. They had their story and they just told it with reckless abandon. And there's a line in the Acts of the Apostles where two of the apostles are arrested and they're, and they're told, we told you to stop preaching about, preaching in this man's name. And of these two apostles, the authorities say, these men have turned the world upside down. That's what we're called to do. They weren't theologians. They weren't experts. They didn't even have the New Testament. <laughs> Hadn't been written yet. And they changed the world by telling people who they met and the difference he made in their lives. So what's required really to do this? I'm going to give you the ingredients. The first ingredient is this. The conviction that God is real, that this story is real, and that living friendship with Christ is better than not knowing him. Like every person you will ever see with your eyes was made for friendship with Jesus. Everybody. There's a beautiful line. It's like this beautiful double entendre. I think it's in the uh, Gospel of Mark where Jesus is off praying by himself in a quiet place and the apostles come and look for him. And they say, everyone is looking for you. The crowd was looking for him because he was going to do some more miracles. But how true that statement was. Everybody is looking for you. Everybody is looking for him, whether they know it or not, whether they're dumpster diving into a life of sex, drugs, and porn, and, and everything that the culture is throwing at us. Every politician that makes your skin crawl and makes you want to rip your hair out, they're looking for him. They are so deceived and so confused, but every person is looking for him. They were made for him. They were made for him. So the first is having the conviction that God is real, that this story is real, that living friendship with Christ is better than not knowing him. Number two, the conviction that God is providentially ordering and leading your life. Meaning that you never just happen to show up anywhere. Like you are always sent by a God of providence who sends you on collision courses into other people's lives. Like when you sit down at a restaurant, it's not just a coincidence that you have the server who's there with you. It's not just a coincidence that the person at the checkout line is the one who's in front of you or the person who's running the machine is the, is the employee. Like there's no coincidences. It's all providence. Back to Thomas Aquinas who thinks and talks like me. Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> he says that God's providence extends even into particulars, meaning that God knows the flight and path of every bumblebee and the curve of every wave. He knows what he's doing. Like, he is sending you out for a reason to encounter these people. So, number one, the conviction that God is real, the story is real, life with Christ is better. Number two, the conviction that God is the providential orchestrator of your life, that you never just happen to run into people that you are being sent into people's lives. Number three, courage. Pray daily for the courage to be a witness. Number four, vulnerability and a willingness to be rejected and to look like an idiot. St. Paul called himself a fool for Christ. I have lowered myself. I have become a fool for Christ. This is a heartless world. It's very hard having a heart in a heartless world. And if you're going to share Christ, if you're going to go and try and sun, light someone else's candle, if you're going to share your story, you're going to be putting your heart out there. And it could go great. Or it could go horribly. And you could be rejected or made fun of. 
But hey, that happens. And if that happens, then you know something a little bit more of Jesus' heart that was rejected. And you go out and do it again. Friends, I want to end with this. This is a reflection on the church and our mission and our role and all that this is all coming to. This is a depiction of the end of Dante's divine comedy. When Dante and his companion, they travel to the very tip of the mountain of paradise and they gaze into the very heart of God. And surrounding the throne are swirling, uncounted multitudes of angels. That's where it's all going. I invite you to listen. When we cast our mind upon the world and try to take a broad view of what is going on around us, we tend to see things under the limits of the present age and time. We look at various countries and peoples that populate the globe and we situate them according to their current conditions. If we remember what is past, it is only as a way of shedding light on the present. The Roman Empire, once mighty, is now gone. So are the great Mesopotamian civilizations of the Assyrians and Babylonians. Ancient Egypt remains with us only in the artifacts it left behind. The Persian, Ptolemaic, and Seleucid empires are known to specialists alone. All these have been relegated to the dustbin of history. They once were, and now they are no more. By the logic of earthly time, such a view of past civilizations and vanished peoples makes a certain sense. As the prophet Isaiah once said, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are counted as the dust on the scales. All the nations are as nothing before God. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. But when our gaze shifts to the church, we can make the mistake of thinking about its existence and its fortunes in the same way. We can view the church according to its current earthly presence and influence and consider its health and its possible future in that light alone. We can look at past ages of the church as vanished and gone, no longer in existence. Such of you might be accurate if the church were like other human institutions, but the church is not like other human institutions. It is a divine body, rooted in eternity, whose life is regulated by a rhythm that is not restricted by time or place. If we could see the church as it really is, if our view could be opened upon what the angels see, we would be presented with a very different picture. We would see a vast company beyond the reach of death, pulsating with divine brightness, basking in the beauty and light of God, powerful in spiritual weaponry, centered on the figure of their divine and beloved King, drenched in joy and eager for the continued gathering in of the renewed human race. We would see an ever-growing body as each generation on earth passed through the veil, from the land of shadows to the real world, and those who had been found faithful to their rightful king shook off the last traces of their mortality and were welcomed home by their brothers and sisters. We would see the angels there, myriads of mighty spirits in the praise of God and in their help for humans. We would see the 12 apostles still administering the church's life, taking thought for their brothers and sisters who were fighting for their place in the kingdom. We would see Mary, the Queen Mother, now revealed in all her beauty and authority, eager to bring aid with tender pity to those of her children, still languishing under the ancient curse. We would see all the great ones from every age united together in friendship and joy as each generation brought another rich harvest to the growing body of perfected humanity until the times were fulfilled and all were gathered in. As we looked more intently, we would see that this glorious body was not in some distant place, in a galaxy far, far away, but was mysteriously inhabiting our own reality, though on a different and higher plane. 
we would see the thinness of the veil separating them from us, a veil through which there was a constant communion and communication. We would see that all those who were now alive on earth, the whole of the world's population were but a momentary snapshot of the actually existing human race. We would see the Christians living on earth as an outpost of the glorious company, sharing its divine life and potency. We would note that these earthly Christians were the least numerous and least potent members of the church's body, inhabiting the outskirts of its life, still plagued by inner corruption and weakness, doing their best to carry the flag of the kingdom for a brief time as they were put upon their trial. One sometimes hears the question asked, whether or not the church will survive. When the true nature of things is seen, the question becomes comical. Not only will the church survive, if such an anemic word can describe the dynamism of its bursting life, but the church is the only part of humanity that will survive. The church is already beyond the ravages of time, free from the darkness of sin and the tyranny of the devil, and its future is gloriously secure. The only question facing those still living on earth is whether they will be joined to that bright race of divinized humans or insist on clinging to a dying and enslaved remnant of humanity that has no future but the shadows. To lay out the deep history of humanity in this way is to address the genuine drama going on all around us. But it is a largely hidden drama. The perspective given us by that drama helps to explain great world events and significant historical developments, many of which remain unsolvable riddle without it. But the drama itself usually proceeds under the surface of things clothed in the stuff of normal daily life, working its way most profoundly in the minds and consciences, the hidden decisions and acts of each person as they make their way among their families and their friends and all their fellow immortals along the path of life. So the battle for humanity will go on until the one who rules all destinies decides the time of fulfillment has arrived Christ continues in every age to build his kingdom, to assault the powers of evil, to attack the fortress of darkness, and to set its captives free. Satan angrily attempts in every age to fend off that attack, trying to maintain his deceitful but now fragile sway over human souls, and to cling, however vainly, to his illegitimate power. Into that battle, into the complexities and mysteries of a graced creation, into a zone of light and shadow, of high hope and quiet despair, of beauty and corruption sprang from a race of rebels, some allied to and enslaved by the devil's tyranny, and others struggling against it by God's power. One fine day, you were born. Conceived from all eternity in the mind of God, created by Him with a high purpose and a hoped-for destiny, we were brought into existence under the watchful and loving eye of the Lord of the universe Himself. In the high-stakes drama all around us, we have each been given a part to play, one that bears our name and no one else's. We each have the mercy of God to receive a self to put to death, a kingdom to win, a battle to fight, and spiritual enemies to slay, comrades to aid, rebels to win over, and a life of love to build as we fulfill our task of inhabiting and reflecting the bright life and love of God, refracted uniquely through each of his children. If the Father's hopes for us are fulfilled, we will embrace the part we have been given. We will receive the grace of forgiveness and new life, renounce the ways of, the, of God's enemy, walk the noble lowly road shown us by his son, learn the lessons of humble warfare, and ultimately ascend the thrones prepared for us before the foundation of the world as kings and queens of God's creation. But if we squander our high birthright, forget who we are,
conform ourselves to the world's dark ways and despise the promises held out to us, like Esau before us, we will forfeit our place in the design of God and end as broken failures. Here then is the real significance of that potent but often misused word, choice. The ancient battle rages all around us and the great adventure we were born for beckons. Life and death are held out to us and all heaven's bright company is aiding us. Our time on earth is short. Our eternal destiny awaits. The choice is in our hands. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, thank you. Thank you for this parish. Thank you for these people. Thank you for their yes. Thank you for your love, and thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your patience, and your kindness, and your tenderness. Thank you for your pursuit, tireless pursuit. Thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for singing and whispering your song of love over us from the day of our conception up to the present day. Thank you for the million ways that you are trying to reach us and love us throughout the day. Thank you for your sacraments. Thank you for your church and for her teachings, for giving us a wise and protective mother. Thank you for good shepherds who laid down their lives for their sheep. And thank you for good sheep. Friends, may God, who has begun this good work in you, bring it all to fulfillment. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.